I love how it does that now. Happy, what is today? Normally we do this on Monday. It's Thursday. Happy Thursday. I'm so stoked that y'all made it. What is up, Mary Beth? I'm going to go ahead and um, give her just a brief introduction and then I'm going to let her take over. So for those of you who are familiar with body and I mean, you guys know what I do as far as the health and wellness thing. Half of you guys are already a part of our wellness community. Mm -hmm. I met Mary Beth through Beachbody. She is a fellow Dare to Dream coach and um, we've obviously connected on more than one path here. So I'm super stoked to let her take the floor tonight. You guys know how I'm all about making sure I don't waste your time. So I'm not going to talk too much. Mary Beth is a structured literacy coach and she helps people of all ages, um, all different levels, disabilities, all sorts of things as far as reading goes and even getting other people to kickstart their teaching businesses, which I think is really awesome and super unique. So I'm gonna go ahead, stop my share, make her the host so she can share her screen and she's gonna be sharing with us her tips tonight to getting our kiddos reading. And I know a lot of us have like pre-k kindergarten or kids um jesse how old, what grade is wesley in? is he in kindergarten or first grade so uh we had him repeat kindergarten this year so technically he is in kinder but he's about to be seven okay yeah so we're we're all pretty much in the same boat i know cheryl's getting ready to have her kiddos i maybe no, your kiddos are just, no, you do have one in school already, and then you have another younger one. And then Lisa, she also has her boy in pre-K, and Jody's son is eight, I believe. Oh, gotcha. So okay, got but like, mostly mostly around preschool, kinder. Yes. And then the oldest would be eight. Right, right. And, and now we do have quite a few people that will be watching the replay, but a lot of the people that um, will be watching the replay, I feel like have older kids, like one in college even. So I'm not I'm not certain what they'll be able to pull from this, but we'll definitely share the replay and uh, it'll be on my YouTube. So I'm going to go ahead and let you take the floor. I've made awesome. the host. So as long awesome. as you know how to dictate things on that end, you are good to go. Okay, awesome. So I can, sh can I share my screen here? You should be able to. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, la la la. Let me find myself. This is this is how I teach online. And it's like every time I go to share something, it's like as if I've never done it before. And I teach you and me both. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's you. like, I'm like, did I just have a stroke? What, what <laughs> happened? Jeez. Okay, so I'm going. There we go. Share and then I should be able to pull that up. And let me just make that a little I'm going to just go into present. Can you guys see that? It's a very busy screen, ladies. <laughs> so I just want to introduce myself. My name is Mary Beth Tullis. I am a former second grade teacher. I taught in Oakland, California from 1998 till 2011. I haven't taught in the classroom full time since... 2011, but I have done some long-term positions, substitute teaching. Um, but when we moved to Tucson, Arizona, um, my son, uh, my oldest son who, well, my oldest son here, uh, he's, he's 16 now. Uh, he was about three years old and I decided not to go back into the classroom and that I was just going to do like volunteer work and things like that. Moving from California to Tucson, the cost of living was way less. So I was, we were able to do that. Um, in California, you know, the cost, I don't know if anyone lives in California, but it's ridiculous. Um, you know, it's, we would just never be able to do that. So I was fortunate enough to be able to do that. Um, and then my own, my, my oldest son was actually identified with giftedness, um, before he went to kindergarten, but here's the crazy part. Um, I sensed that there was something going else going on. Like he just wasn't picking up like on like sounding out words or anything like that. It was just a real struggle. And so that's how we, we, well, when we moved to Cal Colorado, which is where we live now, um, he kept kind of just getting pushed through school because, you know, he had that label of giftedness, which is very tricky. It's, you know, people like, oh, he's so lucky, so smart. It's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's actually a very, I'm the average one in my family. I'm basic. 
right? And then I have all these like really neurodivergent people. Now I have ADHD. I was just recently diagnosed. Um, but uh, my my three kids and my husband are all gifted. And they uh, are, the two, my husband and my oldest son are both dyslexic as well. My husband wasn't identified until college. Um, so it is, it's an interesting path. Um, you know, schools are really set up for people like, um, people like me, right? Typical people, more typical could kind of check the boxes and do the things, but those outliers in the public school system, it's just really, really challenging. Um, so some people think, oh, you know, oh, they're so smart. It's like, I know I, I'm not questioning that dyslexia is not a, it's not a cognitive intellectual issue. Right. So that's kind of the path that I went on was when I came here and we finally got my son identified in seventh grade and his mother's an educator. Way to go, mom. And, uh, you know, I I just was like, I need to figure this out. I didn't teach my own son, but he learned how to read using a method called the Orton Gillingham method. And it's more of an approach. Um a mindset, if you will, uh, to how to teach kids how to read based on a huge body of evidence called the science of reading. And so that's kind of how I got into it. Then uh, a year ago, I opened up um, our, our own practice. So I currently have 10, actually 11 students right now who I work with one-on-one. -on -one. And um, it's amazing. It's life-changing because when these kids get the tools, whether they're dyslexic or not, if they're struggling, they're struggling. I don't need a diagnosis to tell me, right? And But we know best practices. And honestly, I taught the wrong way for many, many years. So um, if <laughs> I have a lot of shame around it, but I'm trying to make right what I really miss because I didn't know what I didn't know, right? And so now I'm trying to uh, build this up and spread word to other teachers, parents, you know, how to advocate for their child when it comes to reading instruction, questions to ask, things like that. Okay, enough about me. So that's all the things we have going on in our house there. Okay, so I am going to give you guys five easy, um, easy things. Okay, I'm going to keep it really simple. That's like part of the way I instruct my students. Very simple, very systematic, very... Um, I don't, I don't like pages with busy things all over it. Like that last slide was stressing me out. Uh, but just, you know, I'd like to keep it really simple. So I'm going to teach you just five things um, to help promote phonemic awareness. Now, first of all, you might be saying, what the heck is phonemic awareness, right? Like, I don't get what that is, which why would you? Because you're not a teacher, right? Maybe you are teachers. I don't know. Any teachers in the house? Ah, yay! What do you teach? I teach high school English. Oh, bless your heart. <laughs> bless your heart. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. High school, like like upper upper high school or juniors and seniors. What do you got? Um, I teach all sophomores right now, but next year I'm going to have some seniors, which I'm excited about because I, yes, I these, love... young, these younger high school kids are killing me. <laughs> I know. Yeah. My son's a sophomore. I, I got you. I got you. Um, it's a lot what they have to be able to do it. And you could probably say you probably have, I don't know what school district you're in or what it looks like for you guys, but we have a lot of kids in the high school that never got the right intervention early on. And now it is just compounding. And these kids, a lot of dyslexic kids, which by the way, is about 15% of the population. So they're in every classroom, right? Um, about half of those kids will also have ADHD and it's not the hyper type usually like my son is not a behavior problem he's not bouncing off the walls but his mind is hyper right so you throw in hyper dyslexia giftedness it's like this big storm right it's it's very hard because there's also with that, and I know some of you guys know this, I'm sure too, just like that ability to regulate emotionally is very, very difficult for, for a lot of these students. Um, so I'm going to give you these five simple activities that, that you can do um, with your own kiddos. And actually, I have a 27-year-old student, and I do these with him. I just don't make it babyish. I try to make it cool, sort of. 
So I'll skip to my next slide. Okay, so what is, okay, so what is phonological awareness? Phonological awareness is just a big umbrella term. It's a broad skill that includes identifying and manipulating units of oral language, words, syllables, um, beginning sounds, rhymes, things like that. Okay, so that's just a, a broad term that we use. So today, I am just going to focus on this piece of it, which is phonemic awareness, okay? I mean, I could talk about this all day. And if you're really interested, I can give you about a million podcasts to listen to and lots of really, really smart people that are way smarter than me that can explain the science way better if you like to geek out on that. Um, but yeah, there is just, this is like a rabbit hole, just so you guys know. You might go down it. I did. <laughs> Okay, so so phonological awareness, like I said, is is that is a piece of phonologic. Oh wait, phonemic awareness is that piece of the phonological awareness, which is like the broader term. Okay, so phonemic awareness is the ability to hear and manipulate individual phonemes, which are sounds, right? Individual sounds in spoken words. Okay, so this is this is going to be a lot of listening type of activities. Okay, I'm going to show you five different things that you can do, but you'll notice there's there's not going to be many letters on here. Okay, we are talking about kids. If they don't understand that words are made of individual sounds, and if they can't hear those individual sounds, learning to read is going to be, I mean, they could fake it for a bit, okay? but it's gonna be really hard once those pictures disappear and we're not telling them, oh, look at the picture or what's the first letter? Or, what do you think it is? You know, things like that, which we did for years, which is completely wrong because that's not how the brain works because our brains aren't naturally wired to read. It's just, if we don't start with this phonemic awareness or this phonological awareness and building that from the ground up, it's like building a house with no foundation, right? And it will catch up. You know, my kid could keep up in first grade, third grade, falling behind, sixth grade, disaster. So it's just, if we can build this phonemic awareness and there's just little things you can do and really make that the focus and talk to your kid's school about what they're doing, we're not attacking teachers. Right. I love teachers. I'm pro teacher, 100 percent. But I will tell you that there is a lot of teachers that don't know. There's a lot of school districts that don't know. My own school district in Colorado, they don't get it. They're like, well, we did some phonics today for 20 minutes. I'm like, this needs to be like the the mindset. This is how we approach it. We are no longer telling kids to guess at words, but yet we still are. Right. So um, that's I'm very, very passionate about it because I know that if they don't have this skill, they're screwed. They've got they've got to be able to do it. OK. OK. So first slide. So this is just and you can see here, I don't have many words. Now, I will tell you, there are so many resources. I am not a creator. OK, I have somebody, one of my um, teachers that I mentor and I'm coaching. She is a creator. Her TPT store, she's the bomb. Right. I am not. So I just take other people's stuff. <laughs> right. I mean, I'm not I'm not selling it. Right. I'm just I use I, I let them do that work. And then I, I love delivering the instruction. OK, so um, there are tons of resources. If you Google it, chat GPT it, um, there's. T, uh, T, uh, TPT is a great resource where you can find a lot of free stuff, a lot of freebies, but you'll want to type in these words. So I'd write these keywords down, you know, final, uh, phonemic awareness, first word, segmenting, okay? Segmenting means that child can take apart a word. So if I say, um, if I say, the, let's just start, be simple, cat, okay? If they could tell me, how many sounds they hear. So cat, k, a, t, and then they blend it together. 
with not even seeing the letters. They're not even, they're not seeing even letters. Now, if your kid is older and they have more skills, absolutely you can give them the letters. But I'm saying this is really from the most basic and you can tweak it depending on the age of the child or the skills that they have. But we we seem to pass through this things so quickly and move kids to like kindergarten and they should be reading. And it's like, no, they shouldn't. <laughs> they don't, if they haven't mastered this, how the heck do you think they're going to be able to read, write and spell? Like, no, that it's just, it's completely backwards. Um, so that ability to hear that individual sounds like cat, at, right. And then they blend it back together. They put it back together. You could also do blending, which is where, or I'm sorry, where I might say, I'll say the word like cat and they have to go at, right? So it's like taking it apart, putting it back together, right? Taking it apart, putting it back together. And then being able to know the position of each of those sounds, right? So sun is going to be, and I have them touch everything. I have, I put Play-Doh on there. I put slime. I put things that they can connect to, right? Rice. I use rice trays, all different multi-sensory things. Guys, there is so much stuff and it's like costs next to nothing. You don't have to buy some big fancy program to do this at all. Um, so sun, sun, and knowing that that mm, is represented here, right? The uh is represented here. This And then knowing that they go from left to right. A lot of kids don't even know that. We have to teach them, right? We use a, a little character called Lefty Larry, right? So he has to set up to help us blend the words. And I can, I can, I could give you a ridiculous amount of resource, but we can talk about all that later if you guys want to connect and I can share more things with you. But there's lots of cool tools and they're free. Okay, so the next... Um, activity that you can do is I, I it's called addition okay addition of sounds so for example if you see down here the word lock and I say um if I'm adding I would say add to lock and then they have to put it together this is harder than you think right it is it, it can be really tricky for kids um, this is also not to say anyone's kid is dyslexic because I cannot diagnose, but I will tell you it's one of the big indicators of dyslexia, not being able to rhyme, um, not being able to pull sounds out, or, I mean, I have a 27-year-old student who I said cat to how many sounds, and he said one, he had no idea, so I had to start there with him, so this is like harder, you know, and he is definitely profoundly dyslexic, this this 27 year old. Um, so lock and then flock. What did I do? I added to make it flock. And then they would just tell you, now they're not writing these words, just so you know, this is all just talking. You're in the car, you're, you know, we, we do just constantly, I try to just embed it in everything that I do with my students period. It just is like they enter the room or the Zoom room and I go, Penelope, how many parts? You know, just constantly and not just doing it in isolation. I do it. I just make it part of who I am as a teacher because it changed everything for these kids. Okay. Um, this one is phoneme deletion. So same thing, same idea. Here you go. You got a word slip. If I took out the ooh, What's the new word? So that's that, again, that ability to be able to manipulate sounds. Oh, I know she took out the old sound. So now the new word is sip, but they're not looking at the text. They're not saying, oh, the L is gone, right? I just put these on here. Well, growing primary, just put these on here so that you can see this is what the teacher would be saying. So slip. And now I get to sip. So now you might say, what did I take out? Or you could say slip, sip, what did I take out? However, lots of lots of ways to play with it, okay? So that's deletion. Okay, and the last one here is substitution. So substitution is going to be 
where, and this is just one way to do it, okay? You can use post-it notes. Guys, there are so many fun activities. There's so much fun stuff to make. I've actually really loved, like I pulled my laminator out and I'm like making this stuff. It's so, it's so fun and it's so exciting. And what's really cool is it's engaging for kids, right? These kids, I mean, I built these sound boxes or, you know, with painter's tape with one of my students yesterday. This is not mine here, but I built it with one of my kids over Zoom. And he was, I was like, do you know why we're doing this? And he was like, for the sounds or what? And I just, the fact, it was only a second lesson that he made the connection. So we're really building that. And he's a fourth grader, super, super bright kid, right? But he never got the, the reading code. He never learned it, right? So now we need to go back and we need to teach the code. And once they can read the code, honestly, the to me, the biggest reward I get from this work is them getting the heck out of my program. I don't want them to be stuck here. The end goal of reading is comprehension, right? Is being able to enjoy literature, being able to have conversations with friends about books and things like that, right? If we don't give them the code, right? I mean, they don't have the tools. Think about all the things that you need, right? To be successful in life. You have to be, you have to be literate, right? You have to be literate. If you it, otherwise you're screwed. So I am doing everything I can to kind of give these kids these tools, right? And I like to just start super, super, super simple. So um substitution was the last one I had here. Oh, I can go back. Hold on one second. Ah. How do I go? This is classic. Okay, I'm just going to run through. I meant to make a review slide. Okay, did I miss this one? I did. This is the very first one. Ah, oh, I knew it. So these go, these actually go in order. So number one was isolation. I'm glad I went back. Number one is isolation. And you can see here, look at this picture here right? There's no words for them. They're just looking at the picture and you're saying, what is the first sound you hear in the word? And then they're going to say, uh, oh, for log. And then they're going to put their marble or whatever these little things are. I think they're from the dollar store, um, over the space where that is represented in the word. Notice no letters yet. None of that, right? And I know for high school teachers, you're thinking, oh my gosh, you know, <laughs> like, but here's what sucks is a lot of these kids miss this. They miss this. And now they've relied on their memory for reading. And we cannot rely on our memory. If you remember 10 words, if you are taught and you can memorize 10 words, you know, 10 words, right? If you can memorize, I mean, if you can do know all the sounds. I think there's 44 different phonemes in the English language. You can make like 26,000 words. So why are we still fl doing flashcards on kids and telling them to memorize? Doesn't work. The research shows there's, there's, it, it, it just doesn't work. While there might be a small percentage of kids, they say 40% of kids that will, will figure this out on their own. There's a whole bunch of kids that have missed the boat and they don't have these foundational skills. And then we're like, oh, these kids can't spell these kids. Well, how could they? they? They've never been taught a code. I think that, you know, at the foundational level, we need to teach this much almost like we would teach mathematics, right? In a very systematic, explicit, multi-sensory way. And then once they get the code, they're on their way. The comprehension and the vocabulary will follow. I'm not saying we don't have to teach comprehension strategies and, and you know, vocabulary with kids and give them experiences to build that word knowledge and stuff. But like, if we're talking about breaking down a word, you cannot expect that a kid is going to memorize a word like isolation. Why not pull out the Greek roots and the Latin roots and the suffixes and the, and look at really deep dive into the words and man, it pays off tenfold. It just, it just makes sense because there's actually a lot more logic to the English language than we think that there is. We think it's like this mysterious thing. It's really not. 98% uh, of words can be explained, the spelling. So 
It's not, I used to tell parents it's 70%. That's bullshit. <laughs> not sure where I heard that, <laughs> but I was doing it. I was saying the wrong thing. Cause I, like I said, I didn't know what I didn't know, but I can name every student from 13 years, every student in my scrapbook that did not get the right tools from me. Some did, and it wasn't from me. It was from private tutors where parents are paying thousands and thousands of dollars. That's ridiculous. It should be in, it should be part of the regular instruction. It's it's just ah it makes me mad. Okay, so the isolation, you get the idea here. They have to pinpoint where the sound is. Okay, the next one was segmenting. Like I said, the ability to hear those different sounds or stretching words like brick, b r i c or b r i c and then putting it back together. Okay, that's the blending part is the putting it back together. Addition, like I said, you 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 were adding in that um uh a consonant a consonant sound. You wouldn't use that for a vowel sound because it wouldn't work in the beginning. Um, deletion is when you're taking something out and then substitution is when you have a word and then you change it. So if you say, oh, we made sap, can you make this, uh, sap, like sap on a tree, right? What would I do? Which one would I move? But giving them a template and a framework to work from, right? Make, don't make it hard for them, Right eventually are we going to have to draw boxes until they're 25 no eventually they don't need the boxes it, it just becomes automatic it's how they do it um and then that that was it i went off a couple times on some crazy stuff i do that i just get excited does anyone have questions or like anything that you have or feedback or what's going on in your schools i'd love to i'd love to hear I sure do. Wow. My mind is blown, like quite literally. <laughs> like, seriously, you have no idea. Like, I, I never, and I've been trying to teach Tegan how to read. And now, like, with you talking, I'm almost wondering because he has the memory of what do they say, memory of an elephant or whatever. Yeah. He, knows, he remembers things from three years ago. He's five. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense mm -hmm. to me. Um, yep. but like, like, so now I'm wondering, is he memorizing the words? Because I'm like, wow, look at this. Like, I just showed him this yesterday and he knows the cat and the dog, like the whole sentence. He can tell me like, so I'm wondering if maybe he is just memorized. Well, I need to break this, it down more and see. Well, the thing is, is that um, what I mean, so we used to for years and I don't know what's going on at your schools, but for years we used to do what was called the three queuing system where we would have tell kids if they didn't know what a word was, we'd tell them to skip it and then look back and see if the picture helps. Or I this, right? This is... No, that, that doesn't work because guess what? What happens when the pictures are gone? It's not there. Right. And now we have three, four syllable words and they don't have a clue. Right. Now, some will be able to figure it out. Some will, most will not. And that's where the explicit instruction needs to come in. Like it has to be explicit. Like the games, the phonemic awareness of games, very explicit. Not some busy worksheet expecting a kid to be able to just read a paragraph. These poor kindergartners are like, I mean, the parents are like, what's wrong with my kid? I'm like, nothing's freaking wrong with your kid. There's yeah. nothing wrong. They're, they're an average kid. Mm -hmm. They just have, I didn't read in kindergarten. I was playing house and like dancing <laughs> around with a rain stick and peeing in my pants. I mean, come on. <laughs> this is, and now these kids are sitting in these academic spaces expected to be able to perform. And it's just, I mean, that's number one. We are, we are introducing stuff way too early, right? The, let them play, do phonemic awareness constantly. Just be like giving them that sense of language. I mean, I'd have my, my sixth graders, I read a sentence to them. They have to repeat it back and tell me how many words are in that sentence, right? Like getting them to understand that sounds build to words and words build to sentences and sentences build to paragraphs. And then, I mean, so my son went from hardly being able to write at all to being able to write, but by the time he learned it was in eighth grade, right? Or yeah, end of eighth grade, he was starting high school 
And he had just learned how to do this. Now, remember, he's also in the gifted program. So it was like, they were like, why is this kid so lazy? He doesn't do anything. He's brilliant. I'm like, um, you don't understand. He actually didn't learn how to read until like this year. So there's that gap, right? So the younger we can do this and get this like, you know, addressed, you know, why are we waiting until they fail? And that's what we're doing. They get to fourth grade and then someone goes, oh man, this kid is not going to make it. Mm -hmm. And it's not an intellectual issue. And they might not be dyslexic. They could just be that they didn't get explicit instruction. Sure. Everybody benefits from explicit instruction. Everybody. You know, you you had mentioned something about like, why don't we teach us like math? And like my, that's when my mind was blown because mm -hmm. I thought about it. Like we start with numbers and then addition and then subtraction, then multiplication mm -hmm. before we get to algebra, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Which is like a freshman year of high school. Yeah. Like, and right. you're saying they're expected to read by fourth grade. So yeah. And be, yeah. and be good readers. And I'm like, how can, if they, if it's like, we've given them the wrong set of tools, mm -hmm. right? Guessing is not, is not a strategy. It never, ever will be. It's not effective because if they're guessing, I mean, it's like throwing spaghetti at the wall and just seeing what's going to stick. Why are we doing that? There's no mystery. There's actually proven methods that we know work. Yes, they cost money because you're going to have to train teachers. But I heard from my own school board or my our superintendent saying we just spent all of this money on this new wonders reading program and we're going to stick it out. Yeah. And I say, and I say, I just want somebody to sue because it's ridiculous. They're like, it's aligned with the science of reading. No, it's not. Because I talk to teachers, like probably five, six new teachers every single week. And they're telling me the same thing. I had a kindergarten teacher in tears. She's my age. She's freaking 48 years old. And she's crying, going, I don't, I don't know what to do. How, how do I even help these kids? Because she said, I don't even know what's what I should be prompting or saying to them. I don't even know where to start. You're making so me it is. school, Mary Beth. Damn it. <laughs> but no, you know, there's 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 schools that are moving in the right direction, but you have to ask questions. You got to ask a lot of questions. And um, you got to you got to see what they're doing at the school, because what I'm doing with kids, yes, it's moving the needle forward. But the kids who move the needle forward faster are the ones who are getting this instruction at their school, too. And I'm just doing, you know, I'm doing the intensive with them to kind of get them caught up. But if they're hearing from me, hey, we don't guess. And then they go to school and someone's saying, oh, look at the picture. Guess what word that is? That's confusing, right? Do you it's think like two different? Do you think you could provide us with like a couple of links of recommendations of like these exercises? I could just share yeah. the PDF with the girls and they could. Oh yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. And I can record. I actually have some recordings of myself of like um, some of my students who I have permission from their parents to share um, of like how they do it. But yeah, I mean. And the the truth is, when I started this, guys, I had no idea what I was doing. I sometimes I don't think I still don't know. <laughs> you but, clearly are ahead of the game for most. No, but but here's the thing: if you're willing to just fail forward with it, it is so it's so amazing. Like I learned so much from my kids. It's amazing. I have had kids come up with ideas for, oh, this is what we could use the painter's tape to mark the sentences and these little, these little uh, googly eyes to make the periods. And we'll put, I'm like, you guys are amazing. Getting them involved as much as possible. Okay. Worksheets at this point, honestly, they're, they, they are fine for some things, but if it's just busy work, stop. Yeah. Stop. Yeah, That's I my, can't believe the amount of opinion. homework my four-year-old got. He's in pre-K oh. for spring break. We got three different things. One of them is a packet. <laughs> they, Tegan loves doing work. So like, I'm-, I'm Oh, he does. Him. Okay, you know what? But I'm just like yeah. surprised. <laughs> you know what? Um, my kids hate doing work and thank God they don't get a lot of homework uh, because that would be really hard. If the homework, if he likes it, great. But if a kid is having to do, 
you know, more than like 20 minutes or 30 minutes of homework a night, I'm sorry, it's not moving the needle forward. It's not. They have seven hours of school, right? And well, then we, yeah. I was why just are talking we, about this. Yeah. Why are they coming home and doing more work? Yeah, more work. They don't need more work. In fact, we, my son's, uh, he has a 504 now. So he started with an IEP. And then once he learned how to read, because we got a private, you know, tutor for $12,000, but it changed his life. Everything changed, right? So then they booted the IEP because they're like, there's no services we can provide him. I'm like, uh, you never provided any services, actually. Mm -hmm. Right. We went and got the out, you know, it's an equity issue. It's it's a civil rights issue. There's kids who don't have access. Most people can't drop 12 grand. We had to borrow money from my parents to, to do or that. Like, your town doesn't even offer anything like that. Right, exactly, exactly. Um, so, I mean, it's 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 pretty pretty criminal what is going on. <laughs> like, cause it's, it's some kids are getting access and when they do their life changes, but then what about those kids who don't have, I mean, my kid slipped through the cracks and I'm a teacher and highly educated. Yeah. So can you imagine a single mom? Right. Right. Oh God. My goosebumps just went down my yeah. back. Oh, my yeah. God. Yeah. So, so, or a single dad, I don't want to, yeah. I mean, it could, whatever. But um, anyway, anyone have thoughts or feedback or anything like that? I'll stop sharing my screen. Take it away, Jess. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I was going to say. So in terms of my my children specifically, I have uh -huh. one who's, I don't know if you've worked with anybody who was a little more severely on the spectrum. Uh huh. But Wesley, he is, he's minimally verbal. So he okay. you know, just recently began talking and signing, um, but you. engaged in anything on paper is extremely difficult. So I'm like, that is something we have a hard time with. So I'm, mm -hmm. I like that you had some information, like some of the activities mm -hmm. involved using pebbles or yep. you know, like little cutouts and things like that, that of course, not a guarantee with him, but it's something to at least try. Yeah, absolutely. I had worked with anybody who was a little more severe. So I have, so how, how old, how old is he? So he is six. He's going to be seven in August. Going to be yeah. seven, and he's kinder, right? He's in kinder right now. Mm -hmm. What is the feedback from the kinder staff? Does he get support? Does he get support, or what does that look like? He's totally in the special education setting okay. right now. With okay. uh, we actually have, I have been advocating heavily to do more integration because mm -hmm. he can go into the gen ed classroom. I was just finding that they were not consistent enough with it, and he yeah. was resistant because it wasn't a part of his routine mm -hmm. so again upon a lot of advocacy and talking with them um they've recently started getting him in there more okay. he's getting more comfortable in that setting um but the teacher herself has not really communicated with me but I do know that he has completed a couple of matching worksheets and mm -hmm. things like that for the first time this year so that indicates to me that th there's at least a little bit more readiness yeah than Previously. And would yes. you say, Jess, that he's minim minimally verbal? I, I really think that he's crossed that fresh threshold because I'm like, I have been calling him nonverbal up until this year, but now I'm like his signs and words. He has, he has probably- He said, what the hell? <laughs> what the hell is that? And I was like- Oh, oh my gosh. He's my best friend already. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's a sassy little dude. He told our, our cat the other day, he was like, shoo, shoo, this is my house. <laughs> I was like, sir, excuse me. I was like, when I met her a year ago. He was not speaking. Oh like, my like, goodness. This is a big deal. So wow. Was, so I'm like, even when he says something that's a little iffy, I'm like, hey, we're we're just gonna celebrate it. Celebrate, but celebrate all of that, mm -hmm. all of that. Yeah, that'd be interesting. I mean, I don't know exactly. I mean, I'm happy. I do. I do free thirty minute calls with families, um, and teachers, uh, uh, but. Yeah, I'm I'm happy to talk with you and because I, I don't have experience with I have my my one autistic student is a middle a middle school student who sat in a self-contained um special ed room for six years. Okay. And I found him when I was substitute teaching. It was like magic. I'm like, who is the kid? And why is he in here? He's dyslexic. He's not, he, he needs should support. not, he needs support. He never learned how to read. He didn't even know the sounds because they were never focusing on that in the SSN room. The kid is brilliant. His vocabulary is better than mine. He's listened to the Hobbit twice. 
Harry Potter reads. I mean, guys, he was not a non-reader. It's ridiculous. And it's like, I told the parents and the parents are like, I'm like, listen, you like, this is ridiculous. Cause now they want to, now that he has the tools, they're thinking maybe he could get, by the time he goes to high school, he could be in mild, moderate needs rather than a self-contained. Here's the problem. Six years of being in an SSN room with not appropriate placement. It was not appropriate. His vocabulary is literally better than mine. I mean, it, he's like, he talks about, I mean, he's out there. He's a little out there, but he's like my favorite student I've ever had. And he's freaking brilliant. I'm like, why is this kid not, why did nobody teach him how to read? Now his whole life has changed, right? And I'm not it's saying we're going to get it for him. And that that's exactly the issue I feel like yeah. we have with Wesley is yeah. we are, especially in a r very rural area. So yeah. access to resources is, is a, extremely minimal. Yeah. It's, it's very, very frustrating. I, I had to advocate for months yeah. to get occupational therapy. Actually, really, it took me like a year to successfully get him in. Oh my therapy. gosh. Because the first diagnostician told me, she called me up the day before the meeting and said, um, are you going to ask for occupational therapy? Because that's going to put me in an awkward like position. And I was like, yes, I'm going to be asking for everything that I think will benefit my child yeah. and help uh, compete with his peers. Like, and oh obviously there, even with the additional support, he is yeah. just a little bit more severe. He has more challenges, but he is so intelligent and there's so much more in his brain that he is able to reciprocate. And you had mentioned, you know, being able to perceive and create speech sounds. Yeah. We believe that was the core of his issue. The first yeah. time he tried to speak, he was pointing at the cat in the hat and saying, cow, cow, because yeah. he didn't do the cheat. He just, he was having a hard time producing mm. the sounds. One day we're at the grocery store. He had said like no words at this point and he counts to 20. Mm. He counts all the items in our, and I'm like, wow. so, what is going on in that little brain? Oh yeah. <laughs> Such oh, a I difficult time. So I'm like, really, it's just a matter of engaging him, him yeah. in something so we can teach him effectively. Yeah. yeah. But what? okay. Conversely, real quick, my yeah. my daughter is one. She is set, she has like 15 words, like maybe yeah. 20, but like she's she's already that's a lot. Yeah. I, don't I think was, my kids were talking until they were like, yeah, two and a half. You know, or, like she yeah. has a lot of words and which kind of tracks with, with my history. I yeah. was in Montessori school reading and, and saying words, you know, very early. Like I, yeah. I was actually reading before preschool and oh, I, I wow. it. So you're I, part of the 5%. <laughs> LOL. There's a few of you guys, my best friend is like that. She was reading at like three years old. But I'm like, what? I <laughs> was not. <laughs> it's like, I also have terrible ADHD. So I'll have to reread a paragraph like 10 times before yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. We sit down yeah. and re we read books together. Me, Lisa, and Jesse. We read the what is it called? I, why am I forgetting it? The A Court of Thorn and Roses. We're losing. There you go. We've been reading that series together, right? Oh, Them two oh, finished oh, all six books in like a month. I'm on book five, and they finished like two months ago. I'm like, y'all slow fuck <laughs> We we're on um, high fixation kind of people. <laughs> yes. No. Oh, yeah. That's the thing about ADD. You can. You can be out there, but then also when you're interested, it's like, then it's like the hyper focus, right? Oh my goodness. So many things, so many things to navigate, but I'm happy to talk to you. And, and if anything, you know, um, I really want to empower parents and, um, you know, specifically moms and, and teachers to not just think of, I'm not, I'm not trying to sell people like a curriculum or I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get people's heads wrapped around the way that the research shows the brain learns to read and what we can do to help these folks that are struggling, period. I don't care if they have a diagnosis, but I'd rather help the adults because then those adults can help their kids. Right. Because otherwise I can only have so much reach and I have lots of Zoom students and I'm very successful with that. But with the little ones, I'm very careful because they really need somebody who's who's right there with them. So something you can ask is, do you have an Orton Gillingham? That's the name. That's the approach. Do you have the Orton Gillingham uh, approach to teaching reading here at our school? Like. We'll come up with a list of questions that we can ask. Cause I tell Please my do. parents, that would be like, amazing. Ask. Because if they're doing the same thing they've always done, 
and expecting a different outcome, it's not going to happen. <laughs> right? I so, love yeah. this. This has been yeah. so amazing. Before yeah. we close out, does anybody have any other questions? Like, seriously, I, I'm not pressed for time if you guys aren't. I don't, I could care less. But I just want to. Quick question. Um, yes. Carol's I'm from Australia. Australia. Yeah. Hi, Australia. Yeah, so I think our, our current school is switched to a phonics sort of system. Okay, um, great. Um, so I think the basics are starting to come through, but yes. um, the issue we have at the moment is we're not sure how much he can actually hear. He's um, scheduled to have an operation to get grommets installed in June. Oh, wow. So, um it, and with the speech um, and the OT have sort of indicated that his speech is sort of um, um, like someone who's got a middle ear of sort of problems. So um, he's only just started talking in the last 12 months as well and has come a long, long way. How um, old is he? How old? He, he'll be five in June. Okay. Okay. So yeah. still pretty, still pretty yeah. little. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so the hearing thing, I would imagine, I'm not a speech language pathologist, like I said, I'm only speaking from my own experience. I, I have not worked with students who are hard of hearing um, uh, before, but does he have like a communicator? Does he have, does he have like, what do they call that? Assistive? Um, it's, we're starting in the, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're starting the process of trying to get some funding to get an ACC device. So oh, oh, they it's won't be. It. Uh, no, because um, the way um the funding in Australia works is through the National Disability um, okay. Insurance Scheme, and uh, for kids under seven, um, they only tend to focus on therapies. Gotcha. Um, and then from there, you got to sort of um, apply for getting certain consumables and stuff. But when he started talking last year, he was sort of excelled a bit. So we thought by the time mm. he got to school, he would be um, further advanced um, than he was. So it sort of slowed things down a little bit. bit. Um, so, yeah, it was sort of. How, how much through. hearing? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, you're right. How much, um, I was just going to ask you how much hearing loss he has. Um, it has improved over a little bit, um, but uh, he can hear a lot of it and can follow a lot of instructions. So we sort of don't know what he can yeah. hear and what he can't. So that sort okay. of makes this sort of process a little more tricky. Got you, got you, got you, got you. Well, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I can do, I'll do a little digging because this is what I do. I literally am like just constantly researching, constantly. I, I can't add like, my husband's like, are you going to go back to school? I'm like, I might, I might, but I don't know if I need to, to do what I'm doing. I still feel like I'm, I'm helping kids, but like, do I want the like research part? I don't know. I'm doing it right now. And it's, it's so interesting to hear diff people's different stories and, you know, you like, know what I wonder, yeah. Cheryl, for your sake, like thinking of like a deaf person, like maybe if you're, when he, when you're say you went to do like these exercises where you're tapping on each little dot going through the word. If he's looking at your mouth and mm. just trying to get him to mimic the sound by looking at the shape of your mouth. So, uh, nah. just be really, yeah. really. There's a... Oh my yeah, God. That's so... a, um, a computer program that's based on the Australian curriculum that we're sort of going through, but we're, I'm having trouble getting, cause we suspect he's got ADHD as well. Oh yeah. Um, getting him to sort of focus enough to go from the start to the finish of the sort of stuff, but it's very similar to the exercises you were sort of um, showing before, where they got the sounds and adding bits and pieces and that yep. sort of stuff. Yeah. So you, there's a free curriculum, guys. That um, I know a couple schools that actually use it. It's called U Fly. U F L I. So it's University of Florida Literacy. Institute, maybe I think that's what it, it's a totally free curriculum. Just Google it. And it actually has a chart that shows the mouth formation. So I think it was probably developed maybe with a, like a speech language pathology, you I know, like, a like speech. they use that in speech therapy for Tegan years ago. I remember seeing little pictures yep. of a cartoon mouth. 
Yep. So you could see exactly what the mouth is doing. I don't use that and I don't use that in mine. Um, but if it comes up that I'm noticing that a kid needs that, I'll say the eh, you smile, the eh, your mouth open, you know, like little things like that. But that's not the core of my instruction. But I know that UFLY program has a really, really good reputation. And some schools are starting to adopt it. As long as they're not doing it in conjunction with, like what I said about that three cueing, right? Where they're going, hey, guess at it. But over here, we're going to break down the word and actually blend it. We got to we gotta stick with what we know works. And then guess what? Eventually, they can go read whatever those, you know, balanced literacy reader books are. Once they have the code, that's then they're good. They're good, right? And then we build on that. So, uh, but no foundation, if they don't have a foundation, they're screwed. <laughs> They've got to have it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my stepmom did pop on and I, she has a boy who is in middle school right now. And uh -huh. a, a, it, from the sounds of it, it's like at school, he can't read like really big words. Becky, I feel like you should reach out to Mary Beth and have yes, a one-on-one -on -one with her. I, I feel like you could really help him tremendously yeah. even just on Zoom. Like if you yeah. guys got together, I think it would Absolutely. be really great. I so. would love that. I would love that. Yeah, definitely reach out to me. I'll give my all my information to you. Of course, like we're still building a website. We're built, I mean, we're a mess. I'm just gonna say that. The business It's a year in, this. girl. It's a year in. That's it. You got my husband's time. like, stop messing up the I'm like all this money's coming in, like from my clients. He's like, wait, where are you putting like where did you pay yourself yet? I was like, where did you get yet? I mean, it's bad. It's really bad. I'm like a disaster. I'm like, I gotta hire a bookkeeper or something because I am not keeping. He's like, you can't just go and spend out of our Amazon account, Mayor, for your. I'm like, I don't know. your classroom's oh. hooked up though. <laughs> Apparently, I'm not teaching financial literacy because I have no clue what's going on. <laughs> All right, Joe. Well, I'm gonna so stop the recording real quick.